The Outdoor Atlas Studio Sessions are brought to you by Fish Hunter Portable Sonar, Know Where to Cast, Sundog Eyewear featuring true blue lenses, and Mark Melnick Outdoors, Time Outside is Time Well Spent. There's an old fishing quote that says, 95% of the fish are in 5% of the water. Know where to cast. For more information, go to fishhunter.com. Welcome to the Outdoor Atlas podcast sessions. My name is Mark Melnick and we have got a special treat for you coming up today. One of the premier guides in the Florida Keys, one of the most sought after guides in the Florida Keys, and a good friend of mine, Captain Will Benson, is coming up right after this. You did what you had to do to get there. You passed through the gatekeepers and went further than the rest. But you may only get one shot. You need a line you can count on. A line that gives you accuracy and control. So you can make the perfect cast when it counts. Oh, oh, oh it's awesome fight! Oh, it's a whopper! Oh, look at him jumping! Vicious. Get vicious. That's really cool fishing. You know, you gotta love it when a guide chooses arguably the hardest fish to catch on fly as his premier source of income. Well, Captain Will Benson out of the Florida Keys has done just that, and he joins me on the line right now. Will, how's it going in Florida today? Uh, it's gorgeous. It's uh, it's really a beautiful early spring day, uh, and so I'm really excited to be here uh, in the office speaking to you. <laughs> early spring for you, man. I've got a foot of snow out f outside my front door, uh, but you you guys have been battered by weather as well, haven't you? We've been battered by weather, and we've been battered by politics. Uh, we have a really uh, kind of a disaster going on here in Florida with uh, Lake Okeechobee filling up and them choosing to release this really toxic water all over our state. Um, it's kind of a, the perfect storm between El Nino and bad politics here in Florida. So, um, you know, things are okay right now, but, uh, it, but we really have somewhat of a crisis going on. So I've actually been doing a lot of work keeping my eye on, on that situation and talking to folks, uh, you know, who have some feelers out there trying to drum up a social media campaign to uh, get folks to write in to, to change that situation. So for those of you who may not know, Will Benson and his brother Jolly um, have been instrumental in the Florida Keys in preventing certain environmental issues from happening at a, uh, at a chamber, at a, at a town level. Uh, so Will's very dialed into what's going on in, in, uh, in Florida as a state. So is the problem with draining Okeechobee, uh, is it uh, the nitrogen in the water or is it, or is it pollutants or wh what's exactly the issue? Well, that, that's, uh, it's akin to understanding, uh, you know, brain neuroscience. It's really, really complicated. Nobody exactly knows what's going on, but to break it down, uh, the water is not flowing down through the Everglades the way it should, the way that it, it historically has, uh, and that's because of a, a, a huge agricultural zone that exists on the south side of Lake Okeechobee. Yeah, I've been there. It's, it's all uh, sugarcane fields. Yeah, right? it's, it's the classic story, uh, you know. And then there's insider politics. So we have like the perfect storm of a of a bad environmental, you know, situation. Uh, and unwilling politicians uh, who won't dedicate the funds that, that you know, and set them aside to fix that. And then on top of that, we've had a, a huge amount of rainfall, uh, unseasonable rainfall here in, in the wintertime, which has caused the level, uh, the water level in Lake Okeechobee to get dangerously high, which mandates that they, they release the water uh, both east and west uh, to prevent the, the dikes on the south side from breaking uh, and and flooding the towns. Um, so that's really the you know the the crux of it. Uh, and a few years ago, the Florida voters actually set aside uh, on Amendment One um, uh, some some funds uh, that were supposed to be used to buy up some of that agricultural area to restore the natural flow to the Everglades. Uh, that didn't happen. So now we're we're you know. There's a huge uh, social media campaign going on 
Uh, I've been, you know, involved as much as I can trying to get people out there to, to write in. Uh, and it matters, obviously, to us making a living down here fishing uh, all over the state. Uh, the, there's a huge big business with, you know, tourism in the state of Florida. So it's a major crisis that we're facing right now. Um, and I'm just kind of involved, you know, on the ground level, as always. Um, there's never any shortage of environmental political issues here in Florida to take on. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So <laughs> if, so if, if we're so, just spring day uh, when we're not out fishing. So if somebody wants to learn a little bit more about what's going on, where can they look? They can look on Facebook. They can look at my profile on Facebook. Um, and they can just, uh, you know, scroll through anything on any fishing guides uh, profile here in the state of Florida and they'll likely find uh, exactly uh, the, a breakdown of the issues but uh, Bonefish Tarpon Trust covers it really well uh, our Lower Keys Guides Association website has all of the information uh, and our Facebook uh, pages uh, does as well cool good 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 all right let's get on to some fun stuff um, you're a permit guide man like I fish permit a handful of times I've managed to to catch one i've hooked a lot of them a lot of them with you um why did you choose to make permit your game of choice yeah i remember uh, hooking that fish and, <laughs> and i remember the I see it every time i close my eyes man <laughs> i'll never forget mark and i'll never <laughs> let you forget either buddy <laughs> um i, I choose to, to do that because i i have always uh rejoiced in the pain and suffering of the difficult <laughs> things in life um, no, I, I mean that it, it's, uh, if you're going to climb mountains for a living, why not, you know, climb Everest? Why not go for the hardest thing out there? Um, I've always enjoyed that challenge. Uh, and I find, uh, the, the people that come down here and fish with me, uh, it's just really exciting to kind of push our limits, uh, and to hopefully if everything goes right, um, catch one, two, maybe, maybe more of them and feel that sense of real deep accomplishment um that's really the drug that, that permit fishing is is all about that's what it offers and once you get a taste of it uh it's very addictive uh i've obviously made my life around it uh have very fortunate to have people who are crazy about this come and fish uh with me you know chasing after those uh and it's just really worked uh requires a lot of dedication and a lot of learning and, and energy going into it but um, it's really, uh, it's just highly addictive once you get into it. So for those people coming down to experience permit, maybe for the first time, what's a, what's a setup for permit look like? Uh, so I'll, I'll give you two things. Uh, this setup, you know, in terms of the tackle, we use uh, nine, 10 and 11 weight, uh, full floating fly lines, uh, crab flies, mostly some shrimp flies, uh, typically a 15 pound test leader. Uh, you can go online and, and investigate all of the, you know, types of rods and whatnot. And I, I won't get into, you know, which brand or that or whatever, you know, that go to your local fly shop, try some rods out, uh, let them kind of guide you down that process. But generally speaking, uh, the gun that won the West for us down here in the Keys is a 10 weight. Uh, so go, you know, try to get comfortable with that. Find something that works. Uh, if you're choose not to get into a fly rod if you come to the keys we have tackle uh, all the guides are sponsored or you know very well set up to to you know provide the appropriate tackle to do that uh, so so that's one side of uh, what permit fishing entails the other side that permit fishing entails is this uh, kind of commitment uh, I would suggest uh, committing to coming down here for multiple days do not in in expect to be able to go out on one day and accomplish it. This is a, a three to five day goal. Uh, so come down here to the Keys, uh, two good times of the year, or really three, the best times of the year, you know, early spring, uh, and then in the middle of the summer through the fall. That, that's really the prime permit season. Uh, come down for multiple days, three to five days, uh, you know, try to, to dig around uh, and find a good permit fishing guide. You can always call me here at World Angling. We it's what we specialize in. Uh, if I'm available, uh, you know, I'll be able to do it. If not, I have a, a, a number of guides that help me filming uh, and, and are all experts at, at this craft. Uh, find a guide that, that you uh, are simpatico with uh, and commit to being with that guide for three to five days so that you can build the teamwork. Uh, and 
I would say within that time frame, uh, looking to you know get consistent shots, get more consistent at, at making quality presentations and beginning to learn how to fish these fish. And if you walk away from that experience, you know, having hooked a fish or two on your first attempt, that's a that's probably a realistic uh, a goal and a realistic accomplishment. Uh, maybe the fishing's better and you are successful and catch one or two, uh, but it's all about starting somewhere, committing fully, uh, and then if if you enjoy that that difficult you know challenge that is permit fishing. Uh, it's, it's going to get easier with time. You're going to get a little less nervous. The shots are going to get better. You're going to develop a better rapport with your fishing guide, more comfort with your tackle, and then all of a sudden uh, those numbers just start inching up slowly, slowly, slowly because you're perfecting the process of permit fishing. Uh, and, you know, if you've done it for multiple years, um, I'd say that, you know, catching one a day is the – the best that that permit fishermen, uh, the best permit fishermen in the world, are catching one a day. So that's really the goal to aspire to. Um, likely, it's something a little bit less than that, but um, it's definitely doable. Uh, you, you you if you commit and you you choose to put in the hard work, uh, catching permit on fly is absolutely doable. But permit's not the only game in the Florida Keys, is it? Let's walk through a, a typical year as to what you might be targeting when you're out on your on your skiff. So what we typically do is, uh, you know, when we have the water temps in the, you know, 60s, you know, and they're a little bit cooler in the wintertime, we have a lot of black tip sharks that are around, jack crevals, which are like small Atlantic trevally. Uh, and we also have, you know, a few redfish and snook that are around, uh, but a big focus uh, in the last couple of years has been the emerging sport of uh, barracuda fishing, which is really cool. We fish them, you know, sight fish them on fly with big tube lure kind of flies, some green flies. You got to strip really fast. There's a violent eat uh, and they do explosive stuff on the line. Um, and those guys are really prevalent in the cooler, you know, water temperatures. And then as the water temperatures start to come up, we start to see, you know, the permit showing up. Uh, and then typically around the middle of February, we kind of break out of that, you know, low 70s and we get like a 73, 74 degree water temperature day and boom, uh, the tarpon start to show up. So uh, that first part of spring is really exciting. You can go out and be cuda fishing in the morning time and then all of a sudden the basin loads up with tarpon in the afternoon or the permit or tailing in the afternoon uh, and it really sets itself up for a magical uh, kind of event. And that's, uh, you know, usually first second week in february this year it's a little bit later uh like i said we've been having those rains and some kind of unseasonable nasty weather but it looks like here in the next you know 10 days or so it's gonna we're gonna get one of those first windows where uh it's gonna get really special so you know that's uh, one of the that's one of the things to keep in mind too when you do go to the keys is is don't discount a traditionally thought of garbage fish like a barracuda they are anything but that. I mean, they jump. They they're not fly shy at all. Um, they greyhound. They will take you in deep into your backing and come running right. But they're, they're a ton of fun. Yeah, I, I talk to people about it who have never seen it. Uh, I said, have you have you ever wanted to see what it's like to sit ringside in a heavyweight <laughs> boxing match? You know, and like almost get hit by the blood splatter that that's that's really the violence that you experience when you're cuda fishing i mean those guys are are badass and uh and, and that, that's it's really really fun you don't get it permit fishing permit are delicate subtle nuanced fish and um you know if you just want a, a good punch in the face then <laughs> <laughs> barracuda are, are, are the way to go for sure it's it's really exciting as the water warms up in the summertime do the tarpon stick around all summer yeah, so, um, you know, it kind of depends on the water temperature. We have, obviously, our year-round residential tarpon. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the cooler the water temperature, the larger the specimen size, the larger fish that are around. And then as it gets warmer in the summertime, typically we see smaller tarpon in the, you know, 20 to 40-pound range. Uh, and there's a lot of those, so it's really exciting. I, I do a lot of fishing with kids when they get the, the summertime off. Uh, fathers who are taking their sons fishing, uh, you know, and that's a perfect fly rod game fish uh, for guys who are, are starting out, especially kids. They jump like crazy. You know, they're manageable. You're allowed to take them out and, and take a picture with them. 
Uh, and it's just really, really exciting uh, jumping small tarpon. So they start off big, they get smaller, and then we typically have another run in the fall at some point of some big fish that show up, you know, in a few key select spots. <laughs> uh, yeah, I won't say anything about that. <laughs> and, and I'll say enough about that. But if you're lucky enough to, to be fishing down here when, when that happens, it can be pretty cool. Doesn't happen every year. But uh, this year we had a, a pretty good session uh, in the fall. And that's also mixed with, you know, the, the regular species for me, obviously, and for a lot of guides down here is, is, is permit. There, there's, you know, 300 days a year you can go out and see a permit. Um, you know, not always the best fishing form. But you have the backup, you know, game plan B if the permit aren't around. But that that persists starting, you know, in February all the way through until December. Uh, and we've had a, a really cool thing where we're seeing a lot more bonefish uh, down here in the Florida Keys. We, you know, for a long time you thought bonefish, big bonefish, you know, go to Isla Morada, come down here to the Keys. And that kind of diminished, you know, a couple of years ago. And, and now we're seeing... Uh, a return of that, we're catching a lot of like, you know, three to four pound bonefish with uh, the occasional, you know, six to ten pound bonefish. I, I caught a number of double digit bonefish down here last year for the first time in maybe, you know, seven or eight years uh, before that cold snap that we had uh, in 2011 that kind of wiped them out a little bit. So that's really encouraging to see that. Um, and that's becoming a much more, you know, staple dependable fishery for us so was it is is this the juveniles that um managed to get offshore in 2011 do you think that this is them coming back now as bigger fish yeah so you, what you're touching on is is the subject uh of uh the somewhat the subject of the last film that i made 90 miles uh the subject of uh, an upcoming film uh about bonefish in the bahamas and kind of a mission that btt bonefish tarpon trust has been on uh, to determine where these fish come from. And what's really cool is it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, Mark. What we believe is that there's an interconnectedness of the entire Caribbean bone fishery. In other words, our bonefish here in the Florida Keys are likely spawned and come from other locations in the Caribbean, be it Cuba, Mexico, Belize, uh, what happens is these large schools of bonefish go offshore, they, they breed, they spawn, the larvae drifts on the ocean current for 30 to 50 days and lands here in the Florida Keys. Um, and so what we think is happening is that now that the, the Cuban fishery is recovering since its collapse, you know, in the early 90s, they now have a spawning, you know, structure there uh, that's bringing new juveniles here to the Florida Keys. Uh, and we're experiencing another uh, boom in the in the population of bonefish, which is really really cool and really exciting. Um, and it it actually it, it it proves again that we're connected. You know the the, the politics and that uh, you know these differences of opinion really don't matter in the world, and that we're all part of the same living breathing o organism. Um, and we're seeing that very clearly with our bonefish. So that brings up a really key point. Now that American planes are allowed to land in Cuba, have you been over, have you experienced the fishery over there yet? I, I did experience the fishery. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to go with the Bonefish Tarpon Trust on a scientific expedition a couple of years ago. I accompanied them as a guide uh, and a kind of, you know, Spanish speaking liaison, if you like, uh, as well as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and I made the, the film 90 Miles about this issue and about the connectedness of our fishery. Uh, since then, I have not been back. But there's talk of uh, both allowing boat travel from Key West and Miami back and forth to Cuba, as well as uh, some flights opening up between Key West, Miami, and Cuba. Um, all the details aren't quite sorted out yet. I guess there's uh, some agreements that need to be uh, hashed out between the U.S. government and the Cuban government, exactly. I guess there, there's, it's legal at this point, but the airline industries have some technical stuff that's keeping flights from occurring on a very regular basis. Uh, but it's every day there seems to be, you know, the, the gaps widening just a bit more, and, uh, you know, the freedom to travel there is becoming easier um, and easier. There's a lot of great groups that are going down there, and uh, it's really encouraging to see the health of that fishery and 
the mindset of the Cuban people and the Cuban government to preserve and protect it as an invaluable economic resource. You know, okay. catch and release, release sports fishing being a huge economy, you know. Great. So let's talk about that in a minute. We're going to take a short break and hear from some of our sponsors right now. The New Fly Fisher is a documentary series that brings to television one of the most beautiful, relaxing, and artistic outdoor sports, fly fishing. Fly fishing is one of the fastest growing outdoor activities for men and women alike, and for good reason. From Ernest Hemingway to Brad Pitt, fly fishing has held a special allure, an almost zen-like quality. It's all about connecting with nature. Taped in beautiful and scenic locations throughout North America, the New Fly Fisher helps viewers to discover new locations to explore. From mountain lakes to ocean wetlands, the series profiles the best of destinations. The New Fly Fisher is also about teaching. Using 3D animations, underwater cameras, and unique instructional methods, this series helps viewers to understand how to fly fish. The New Fly Fisher, the art and science of fly fishing. Welcome back to the Outdoor Atlas podcast session. I'm Mark Melnick on the line with Captain Will Benson straight from the Florida Keys. Will, we were just talking about the economic and the fisheries uh, available that are soon to be available uh, for Americans in Cuba. You've experienced it. Let's talk about uh, how great that fishery is. It's, um, it, it's really, there, there's, there's, it's, it, it's fantastic. I think the entire experience in Cuba is worth going down. Uh, from my understanding is it's uh, a little pricey, uh, but I think, um, you know, what isn't these days? I mean, if you want to have a legitimate, authentic, authentic experience, uh, you, you're going to pay for it. And I can't recommend it uh, more. I think it's fabulous. The people are warm and hospitable. They really understand their fishery uh, and they understand how valuable it is. Um, and that's that, uh, that to me is maybe the most striking thing. Uh, between, you know, here in the United States, sometimes I think we can just take things for granted. And I think there, there's really a deep appreciation um, and some cultural pride for how healthy their fishery is. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. If you want to go experience something that is remarkable, um, pristine, I can't recommend it enough. There, you know, Cuba is just a fascinating place uh, in every regard. Uh, not just the fishing, but the people, the culture, uh, you know, Havana, the cars, the, the, everything that you've seen in the films and read about, it's it's all there. You spoke of a film that you created down there called 90 Mile. Um, you're not just a permit guide, are you? You are quite an accomplished filmmaker. Tell me a little bit what's going on with world angling. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's funny, I, you know, I think... I, I, as, a, as an artist and a creator, and, and as a fishing guide too, I think you ride these kind of waves uh, in your life where you find passion and inspiration. And uh, I certainly, you know, rode a, a, a great wave of energy uh, early on in my career. You know, made some really cool media, uh, and then things changed profoundly for me. Um, I had two children, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I. If I thought permit fishing was hard, <laughs> I had no idea uh, what real difficulty was because uh, once you have kids, it makes permit fishing on fly look, look easy. Um, and I mean that seriously. So I, I think I've kind of stepped back a little bit from the camera and uh, you know focused the energy here on the family. It's been great watching my daughter Alice and, and my son Luke grow up, be on the boat, be out on the water, learning to swim, all of those wonderful things. And, and it, it, what's really cool is it's made me think perhaps about what the next story I want to tell is and, and, and maybe how to reinvent world angling or reinvent myself and, and take the messages in another direction. Uh, and I'm very passionate about, you know, telling stories uh, and I'm very passionate about my family and my children. So I envision uh, the focus of world angling moving forward being um, being about that next generation. I, I remember growing up as a kid, as I'm sure you do, Mark, watching Jose Wahebe yeah. and Flip Pallet, you know, uh, on Sunday mornings when I was a kid. And, and they were really mentors to me in a certain way, even though I didn't know them. 
I, I learned the etiquette. I learned about the sport of fishing from them. And I feel that there's kind of been a lack of that uh, in the fishing industry lately. And, and I would love to, um, you know, kind of maybe take a little bit of uh, inspiration from them and focus some of the messaging uh on the next generation, my, the, you know, my children or the, the kids that are coming up in the sport uh, and craft some stories that are for them, you know, not about myself and, you know, what my experiences are, but, but what is it, you know, what does fly fishing mean and, and, and kind of, you know, communicating and, and educating and hopefully inspiring that next generation of, uh, of fishermen that are coming up. You know, that's, you bring up an interesting point that, you know, we've lost Jose. Um, Jose was killed and couple of years ago in a tragic plane crash um flips getting up in years and and i would imagine is starting to slow down i'm not i'm, I'm seeing him very involved in boat building and and the marketing side of that thing um but i don't i'm not seeing much in the way of of a television presence other than walker's key chronicles um who's who's the next who's the next one who do you think is gonna is gonna come up through those ranks and and i mean you're a great filmmaker uh, who's going to be the next big presenter yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, um, you know, uh, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to try to remain authentic and tell stories where I see them, the value, whether it be a, an environmental issue or, or just something that's pure entertainment. Um, and, and to answer the question, I think there's a lot of good folks out there, uh, yourself included and, and, and others that, that, I mean, there's so many of them that are doing a great job, uh, the, in, certainly the accessibility to cameras and to editing and all, I mean, it's iPhones. I mean, you think about some of the coolest things that I've seen lately are just simply, you know, little videos that people are making and, and, and saying their own two cents about what they feel and whatnot. So I don't know if there's ever going to be anybody as iconic as a flip palette that's going to emerge. It might be a larger kind of, uh, you know, group of folks that are all combining to tell a story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that's if that's in the cards, uh, but I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to continue to kind of seek out, you know, some stories uh, and hopefully, you know, get it to the audience and and inspire people to pick up a fly rod and to care about the issues and to uh, enjoy the sport uh, and find the fun uh, in, in, in going outside and stepping outside of our comfort zone right. uh, and experiencing, you know, something that's uh, wilderness. Um, so I'd love to be that person, but, you know, you know, at the same time, uh, I don't know, you know, if that's, uh, if it's going to be any one person, I, I don't think it is. I think it's going to be all of us kind of changing the consciousness of, uh, you know, of the fly fishing world. Well, and how lucky are we to be able to say that we're part of a generation that grew up watching those guys, right? I, I agree yeah. with you, I agree with you that things are going to change. Our landscape is changing through technology and, and all the reasons that you just, you just listed. But I mean, we grew up watching those guys and I got goosebumps just telling you, talking to you about this, but they really laid the platform for guys like you and guys like me that really appreciate it as much as we do now. Yeah. We're so, so fortunate. And, I, and I've been so fortunate to, to get a chance to, to meet Jose and, and, uh, and to fish with him and do a show with him and to, to meet flip and to meet lefty. Uh, I mean, I've had, you know, some of the coolest experiences, uh, you know, that, I never thought I would ever be able to do, and I've been very, very fortunate. But I don't take that lightly either. I think with that comes a sense of of responsibility, uh, you know, to to communicate and to give back and to stand up and and uh, and, and say what you believe and and, and uh, communicate your passion. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I think about it all the time. But uh, at the same time, I I wonder, you know, watching my kids come up, you know, what what are they gonna what are they going to turn to, and 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 how is the sport going to look for to them, and, and and where are we going to evolve, all of us, you know, together, uh, within the sport, and um, you know, it's a very interesting time. Uh, it's uh, and and I think there's a lot of really really cool stories out there to tell. So I'm looking forward to making some myself, and also enjoying what others are are making because it's uh, there, there's a lot of really talented people out there. Absolutely. Well, listen, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, Will. Will Benson can be found at? Worldangling.com. Yeah, man, you can see his films. You can see his films on there and find out what uh, what 
what the latest reports are down in the keys and and see his real core group of, of fly guides that work out of world angling so thank you will for your time and uh we'll see you on the water sometime soon i hope yeah, I hope I hope we get a chance to connect again uh, very soon, Mark. I, I know uh, I, I I feel it's in the cards, man. <laughs> we got to get another crack at those permit at some point. Brother. Absolutely, I got to get this monkey off my shoulder. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for watching, everybody. This has been Mark Melnick with Will Benson on the Outdoor Atlas podcast video sessions.